today's reading it comes from Mark chapter 11. We are continuing on our series, Mark's Gospel, verses 12 to 26. Here is the word of the Lord. The next day, when they went out from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out if there was anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. They came to Jerusalem and he went into the temple and began to throw out those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves and would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. He was teaching them, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. The chief priests and the scribes heard it and started looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was astonished by his teaching. Whenever evening came, they would go out of the city. Early in the morning, as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you curse is withered. Jesus replied to them, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, Everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you your wrongdoing. And this word of the Lord, thanks be to God. My theme for today is the marks of a faithless church. and what it is like to be a faithful church. It's going to talk about the marks of a faithless church, but I know this, that towards the end there, I think Jesus is giving us, you know, some teaching on how to be a faithful church. So how can you tell a church that is faithless and fruitless? What can be the warning signs that our church, even this church, has become unfaithful and unfruitful? And so this is the story that uh, we've, here in Mark 11 verses 12 to 26. See, this is here in this story we find this is one story being divided into two parts. You notice that? So it begins with the fig tree being cursed, and then they go to the temple, and Jesus is cleansing the temple. And then they went out of the city, they came back the next morning, and they saw the fig tree being cursed has been has was with it. Jesus teaching them about having faith in God. And so by implication, it seems that it's just one story. The fig tree, the temple, the withered fig tree, that's just all about the religion of Israel, the church of Israel, that the church of Israel has become unfaithful and unfruitful like that fig tree. It's become a faithless, a faithless church, a fruitless church. So how can we tell a fruitless church and how can we distinguish the faithless church from the faithful church? And here I made three observations. That is, firstly, a faithless church looks very beautiful and godly on the outside, but lets the power of godliness to produce godly fruits in their lives. And this is from verses 12 to 14. Secondly, a faithless church emphasizes on what do you do for God, what you bring into God and not on what God has done for you. This is from verses 15 to 19. And lastly, the third point is what a faithful church is like. A faithful church is a prayerful, merciful church. And that's from verses 20 to 25. So, firstly, a faithless church looks very good and beautiful on the outside, but lacks the power of godliness in life. This is the story of the fig tree, right? From a distance, we're told, 
she says saw it looking really leafy and really beautiful. You know, this is the kind of fig tree that if you were to look at it, you know, if you were to walk past it, you say, hey, it's a beauty, it's beautiful, it looks leafy and green. It gives all the impression that it has fruits. Even though it was not the season of figs, Jesus was looking at this fig tree and thought that it was bearing fruit pre-season. Because you see, for the fig tree, now my, our neighbor, he's got a fig tree, fig tree at the back. And uh, right now, because it's winter, there's no leaves in the fig tree. The leaves will come back, you know, towards December, towards summer. And Jesus uses it in Mark 13, where he says, you know, when you see the, the, the fig tree you know, budding, the leaves of the fig tree budding, you know that summer is near. And that's what happened. Jesus saw this fig tree being leafy. That's an indication that this started to bear fruit and thought this was a pre-season fig tree. When he, he found nothing but leaves. That is, it's a fig tree that has all the marks of being alive, yet it is, it's no different from a leafless, lifeless fig tree. It has all the marks that it's been abundantly watered by rain. It is in the right season. It is feeding on good soil, yet there is no fruit. That is, it bears all the marks of having received God's grace, God's mercy by rain, sunshine, everything God has provided, even a good soil, for the fig tree to bear fruit. There's no fruit. This is the kind of fruitless, faithless church that Paul, you know, warns young Timothy about. And here is 2 Timothy 3, verses 5. Paul says to Timothy, you know, the church of the last days, and we are living in the last days. You know, we've been living in the last days since the first coming of Jesus, and the last days will conclude when Jesus returns again. And Paul says, it looks like this. It looks leafy on the outside. That is, it has the form of godliness looking godly on the outside, but inside it denies the power of the word of God, the power of godliness. That is, it looks impressive on the outside you know ministers like myself you know reverend doctor with a, you know a dinner jacket and a coat and everything you know it looks really good every all the qualifications and all you know the biblical uh, view doc, uh, doctrinally right everything is right but if you come near and look into the way they live the fruit there is nothing and this is what the life of that kind of faithless church is like, you know, this is a description of the church. This is not a description of the people of the world. Listen to this. This is 2 Timothy 3, verses 2 to 5. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. And Paul says to Timothy, avoid this. Do you see that? It looks really good on the outside. It has a form of godliness. It really looks godly on the outside. Have a, you know, it's, it's just like the church of Laodicea in Revelation uh, chapter 3. It has everything. Richness, and, you know, have a, a good church building has it was a very rich church but jesus was not inside there was no inner fellowship with jesus jesus was knocking from the door outside the church so this is the character of the church that appears really leafy like this victory looking good on the outside godly from a distance even to jesus but life of its people no different from the life of the people of the world now, you know, I see this in Christians, a lot of Christians today, and especially now in the situation under the pandemic, under the coronavirus. You see, I'm amazed at how more and more Christians have given in to thinking that they must stand up and fight for their rights and their freedoms. Is, that, is a Christian, are we a Christian called to fight for their rights, for their, for, for, for their, their freedom? You see, we don't realize 
But this is the thinking of the world. See, this world tells us that we are living under an oppression regime, whatever it is, the West, even here in Australia. And therefore, we really need to rise up and stand up. And if, they, if these people tell you something to do for your, even for your good, they're oppressing you, they, you know, they don't respect you. They, see, we're given in to the narrative of the culture. We think that we must stand up and fight for our right, fight for our freedom. We become freedom fighters, so to speak. Don't you see the demonic lie that we have accepted? That we need our freedom to do what we want? Don't you see that that is self-centered? That is love of ourselves rather than loving others? This is us living for ourselves and not looking out for the good of others? Don't you see that? We were slaves of sins. And, and that's what Jesus says in John 8, 34. And then, Jesus set us free. We don't need to fight for our freedom. We are free. We've been set free by Jesus. Jesus said, if the Son set you free, you are free indeed. But we're not free to live for ourselves. We are free to live for the Lord. We are free to be slaves of the Lord Jesus. You see, it's not a suppression, not a compulsion to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus said. Greatest command. Love God with all you are, your mind, soul. Love your neighbor as you are. See? It's our gracious, loving master Jesus' words for our own good. It's not a compulsion. It's not oppression. You know, to be vaccinated out of love for my neighbor, wanting to do good to them, to make sure that they are safe every time they are around me, that's not an oppression. It is what it means to show the power of Christ's love in our hearts. We have been set free to serve others, not to serve ourselves. What about us? See, us here in church. See, we, we are, in, in a sense, we are the token Bible-believing church, aren't we? Been kicked out of the Uniting Church and been wandering in the wilderness of this world. And, and here we are. Tongan Evangelical Wesleyan Church. There can be nothing better, isn't it? We all agree to stand you know, upon the Bible, the scriptural view against homosexuality, that it's evil, it's detestable to God, it's against God's will. But let me ask you, how serious are you about obeying and living and subjecting your life to the whole of Scripture? Do you want to live according to the whole of Scripture, or are you just picking and choosing the bits and pieces of the Bible that you like? You know that the devil, even the devil knows the Bible. Even the devil quotes the Bible to Jesus. It's not a sign of a faithful Christian to quote the Bible. And you know, how 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 serious are you about living in accordance with the Word of God? You see, if you are a man. Are you able to lead your family in prayer? Maybe you're able to lead your family in prayer, but how do you love your wife as Christ did? If you're a woman in our church, you see, see, maybe you are able to put the veil in your, on your, on your head to, you know, to show that you're under Christ in church. But what about the gentle and quiet spirit of the woman that should be the, you know, that's the ornament. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 and 10. It should be, you know, the woman is rich in good works and a gentle and quiet spirit. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Are you serious about living, subjecting your life to the whole of the Bible? I was in a conference yesterday of Westlands from New Zealand. This is a good, good thing about the Zoom. You, know, you, can able to, you can be able to join any conference anywhere. This church, the Wesleyan Church, uh, Methodist Church of New Zealand, they were like us. They, were, they separated themselves from the Methodist Church in New Zealand because of their biblical stance on homosexuality. Do you know what I heard yesterday? They're so on about this thing about ordaining women and women leadership and, and that, that we are patriarchal and we are oppressing women by not allowing them to lead in church. You know, And they said this is a Wesleyan thing. Do you see that? They, 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 they're serious about homosexuality, but 
when it comes to mayor leadership that the Bible, you know, tells us, you know, they, they go to all kinds of places to justify this, this, this cultural value that has sneaked in that, you know, it's patriarchal. What's wrong about patriarchal? Isn't, isn't God our father? There, there's nothing about that. It's only wrong because, you know, because we, we think that it's an oppressive sort of thing, but it was intended in the beginning for our own good. You see, the power of God in this should be life changing, should be life transforming, should be changing our lives in every aspect in accordance with the scriptures. You know, there is also the reverse of it, isn't it? That is, you can show all the fruits, you can be loving and being good, and that, but then your life's not yet being touched by the love of Jesus. That is the reverse of, you know, having a form of God in us in the outside, but no power in the inside. Do you see that? You see, if that's how you do your life, you, you're just doing good and you haven't experienced the love of Jesus, very soon you'd start complaining about others who are not living like you. Very soon you'll look down at people who are not like you. It's just like the Pharisee. You know, you stand up and you look down at everyone else because you think you're more righteous than themselves, you see? Having a form of godliness, looking leafy and good on the outside, but no fruit. You see, what happened to the church? What happened to the fig trees? What happened to such a church? Jesus cursed a church like that. But secondly, you see, a fruitless church is one in which the emphasis is on how you, on what you do for God and on what God, and not on what God has done for you. We come to verses 15 to 19, and here we, we read about the structures that were set up in the temple, inside the temple, and these were set up to enable the offering of the sacrifice. You come to the temple, you come from far away, you, you don't have a truck or anything, you know, put your, your cattle or your, your lamb, your sheep on it, so you just bring money, you know, just come and buy something from, you know, from, from this market in the temple so that you can do your sacrifice in the temple. So these things were set up. It was good. It was meant for people, for the worshippers to come from afar, bring money, buy whatever kind of animal they can afford and sacrifice. Even the poor people, you know, the doves are mentioned in there because that's the poor people's sacrifice. So what was Jesus' problem with these structures? Why did he need to cleanse them from the temple? Now, I don't think Jesus is setting up a uh, justification for having an occasional punch-up in church, you know, though I consider that what many Tongans are saying here, that, that Jesus whipped the stubborn religious people of his time, so we too must whip the stubborn religious people of our time. No, I think the reason is clear. Right? Verse 17, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it into a den of thieves. You see, the emphasis is on sacrifices becoming, you know, becoming something that is so important that it's really about me and what I can bring to God and not about God and what he has done for me. You see that eventually you think that God needs your money your sacrifices, your time, your skills, that God is quite fortunate to have a person like me. Look at me. Look at what I can do for God. See, we forget why we come to God, why we come to his house. We come to his presence because God's presence was in the temple in Jerusalem. We come to glorify him, to give thanks to him. To thank him for all his mercies in providing, you know, the Israelites, they come from afar. They were meant to come and give thanks to God for providing rain for their crops, the success of their farm, you know, and their lands. They come to give glory. They were meant to bring their stuff in order to rejoice in the presence of God, you know, that you know, reminding themselves that it was God who has given them all these things, even the money. So that they will learn to fear the Lord. See the problem if 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 the church is really about what you do for God and not what God has done for us, there are two problems that could happen. You see, eventually you think that you serve God, right? That God is there like a dead God. You start to think that He needs your money, He needs your food, He needs 
your skills. He's served by human hands. No, that's a dead God. But also, sacrifice becomes the act of worship. You don't. You think that your that because God wants your money, your sacrifice, your temple tax, and your animal. You start to think that you can just give these things and to God, and then you do what you want, live the way you want. You see, this is what the prophet was speaking against. This is Isaiah uh, chapter one, verses eleven and sixteen. God is speaking to the time of Isaiah. What are all your sacrifices to me? Asked the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of well-fed cattle. I have no desire for the blood of bulls, lambs, and male goats. Wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Do you see? They brought their sacrifices, but their lives was not changed. God is interested in your life. You see. True religion is really about how you live your life daily, how you think about your colleagues at work, how you think about doing your report at work, how you think about your husband, your wife at home, how you think about cooking at home. You know, it's really about every aspect of your life must be transformed. And here is Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, "Do you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods that you have not known?" Then you come and stand before me in this house that bears my name and say, "We rescued." So we can continue doing all these detestable acts. Do you see that the temple has become just a security policy for being sinful? See, is that how you? Is that why you come to church, just to tick the box? You know, then so that you go on living your life next week from Monday to Saturday the way you want it to be. You see, every breath, every breath we take is a gift. Every day we live is Lord, the Lord's mercy. You see, we are to come to God with a heart of thankfulness. He has been faithful in 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 providing for us, and so also that Jesus, His sacrifice suffices for our sins. And that's why we come every time. If you Don't if you if you can't think of anything to thank God for, at least thank God for the sacrifice of Jesus. That's why we don't have to bring any more sacrifice. And I take it that's why Jesus cleansed the temple of the sacrifice. He is preparing them for His sacrifice, the one and only sacrifice that is required to do away with our sins, so that we don't come to the Lord with anything. We just come and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. You know, allowing our minds to be transformed. So that we don't conform to the pattern of this world. But lastly, a faithful church. So, what does a faithful church look like? It seems to me that the last part is is talking about having faith in God, you know, and praying you know, without doubt. That a faithful church is. You know, a faithful church is a church that desires God to be merciful. It's it's a God. It's a church in prayer, and it's a church that is. Gracious to others, you see. When they return the next morning, the fig tree has withered, and then Jesus, based on that, start teaching them about faith in God expressed in our prayer. That is, everything you pray and ask for, believe you have received it. You see, we don't just say our prayers, then we leave it there and we go and do things, though the things that we pray for, because that's treating God like a dead God. We don't just pray and, and, and go and do it ourselves because we want to see the things that we are praying for being accomplished. You see, no, we pray and we entrust all things to God, trusting He has the power, He has the resources, He has the wisdom and the perfect timing to do the things that we ask for. That is, that's why we pray for the pandemic. You see, our Lord rules over all things: the sea and its waves, the devil and its legions. And even coronavirus is under the reign of our good Lord. We pray for healing because He's the Lord, our healer. We pray that the spread of this disease will be halted. We put, we, you know, we, we, we'll stop because God puts sand as an enduring barrier to the sea, and the sea cannot pass over it. We pray for the vaccines that can help to protect people because God created all things good, and in the beginning. It's it's to provide for our good, and this was so. We are confident in the power of the Lord. A faithful church is a church in prayer and trusting itself to God, because 
We know that our God is this. This is Psalm 18, verse 20. Our God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. So we're a faithful church in the church in prayer because you see, Paul warns us about being an unfaithful church. In 1 Corinthians 13, he says, if I speak the, 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 if I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, that's what Jesus was saying here in the story. Even if I have the faith to move mountains, even in my prayers, I'm able to move mountains. You see that? But I don't have love. See that? I am nothing. See, a faithful church is a church in prayer, but it's also a church that loves others like Christ. So if we are a faithful church in prayer, our faith is to be shown in our love for others, in loving our neighbors, ourselves. Let me pray. Just in the quietness of your heart, you can pray and thank God. But let me pray for us. You say amen in your heart so that you can pray with me. Father, we want to thank you that, you know, this passage is there to warn us not to be like this fig tree. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we will bear fruit. Not only we show a form of godliness on the outside, but deep inside our hearts being transformed by your word. That we don't want to live only the bits and pieces of your words that we agree with, but we want to live according to the whole counsel of God, your, all your word. And also, Lord, we thank you for this warning against us being like, you know, the religion in Jesus' days, trusting in what we give, what we bring to you, and not, not trusting in what you have given for us. Your sacrifice, Lord Jesus, the only sacrifice that we need. Your sacrifice is the sacrifice that we should forever live to be thankful for. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray, help us each day to be thankful, to be drawn to you in prayer, out of thankfulness for the transformation that you've done in our hearts because of your, of your great love for us. But also, Lord Jesus, make us a congregation, people who love to pray, to pray and trusting ourselves in you because you're a powerful, merciful, perfect, holy, righteous. You are a loving God who cares for your people. And that Lord Jesus, we should bring our concerns to you because you are able to do for us what is impossible in accordance with our own strength and might. You are able to move mountains because of our prayers, but we pray, Lord Jesus, that we be people who live, that the, the faith, the faith we express to you in our prayers would be shown amongst us by forgiving each other, by bearing with each other, by loving each other. This, Lord, we pray for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, fellowship with the heart.